Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Hosting Art. I am Diana Boros. I'm professor of political theory at St. Mary's College of Maryland. And Hosting Art is supported by both the Guestbook Project and also the Center for Psychological Humanities and Ethics at Boston College. Um, and today, uh, for today's episode, I'm here with Tom Finkelpearl. Welcome, Tom. Thank you for being here. Um, Tom, <laughs> Tom has worn many, uh, many, many hats in the art world. Uh, he's former commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Prior to that, he was the director of the Queens Museum for over a decade. Uh, prior to that, he was deputy director at MoMA PS1. He also ran the city's Percent for Art program. Um, I'm sure that I've left something important out, um, but currently Tom is teaching courses in social practice art at CUNY, the City University of New York, and he's also published two books, two books that have been really useful to me and the work that I do. One is this one, the first one, Dialogues of Public Art, and I'll talk a bit about that in just a minute, and the more recent one, um, What We Made, Conversations on Art and Social Cooperation, um, and I love them both. They are both sort of structured in a somewhat similar fashion where Tom has sort of brought together a whole lot of people into discussion to talk about public and socially cooperative art. And that term in particular, I like as well that you've chosen cooperation over many, many other terms, including collaboration. Um, so I have some questions about that as well. But the the first thing that I actually um, wanted to talk about in, the, in this book you talk a lot in the introduction about the move out of the city, the move away from the city throughout the 20th century, particularly the second half of the 20th century and then into today, um, how more and more people were sort of abandoning, right, the, the, the robustness and vitality of the city moving out into the suburbs and choosing uh, privacy, choosing ultimately isolation, choosing as you say, fragmentation, separation, right? And making these choices. Now, this book is not so recent, right? This is this is a couple decades old. And you know, you read that now and you're like, yep, and it's gotten worse, much, much worse, right? Like this has only continued in in my view. Uh, we continue to make those choices. And then, you know, for better or worse, look at where we are now, particularly post-pandemic, where I mean, if you are of privilege, right? If you have the means, then you can stay at home and have everything come to your home, right? You really never have to leave. You really never have to deal with the public at all, right? You can phone it all in. You can have your food come to you, everything, right? Um, if you're of privilege, your children never have to see the public, right? You can live in a gated community and you can have a uh, private school and and a private car service, and a pri right? You never have to sort of deal with all these public things that we have, right? Whether it's our libraries or our schools or our bus stops or our parks or our streets. And so I was thinking about that and you focus a lot on how this um, sort of like obsession with privacy as this good, as this value, as this sort of asset has caused us all to sort of go into, into our own world and push away from being together, right? From cooperating, from collaborating, from socializing, from experiencing the world together. And I, I am continuously um, concerned about this. I think a lot about this. I think about the health of our public spaces in general. Um, and But I also think, and this will also sort of connect to a lot of what you talk about in here, that in art can be a force for, for good in this sense, um, in these conditions. So I guess I want to ask you, it's been a while since you published this, yeah. since you wrote this, uh, what do you think about this sort of issue of privacy and isolation and fragmentation and, and what I would say is individualism, like a push for individualism over communal mindedness, you know, today, right now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because I'm living in New York City. Yeah. And New York City is the only Northeastern industrialized city which um, lost a lot of population and then uh, regained its entire population at its urban core. So people left New York City, there was a big you know, downswing of the population starting in the 80s, the 90s, the aughts, et cetera. People flocked back to city and these, these are sort of educated people. So the inflows were greater than the outflows. And the biggest uh, contributor to the inflow was also immigration. So the change in the immigration laws in the 1960s leading to the beginning of the inflow in the 70s and the 80s. So what had happened uh, after I wrote that book was that you know New York City was had 
got to this moment in which it was the, the largest it had ever been. This is not true for a lot of other cities in the state. So my uh, experience of it was a little bit different maybe than your experience if you're not living in New York City. But then what's happened and what you say is true is that the uh, pandemic changed a lot of those dynamics. And if you look at, there was just an article in the New York Times two weeks ago that said educated people are leaving New York City and the big coastal cities for cities that are less expensive. One of the things that happened in New York is it just became insanely expensive to live here. I truly believe that real estate interests are destroying our cities. It's like, how much money do you need to make on these properties? It's really disgusting. Um, but I think at the other thing, I felt like you know some of the art that was being made uh, either consciously or unconsciously around this idea of sort of creating art together in community was a response to the emptiness that people are feeling because of the last block, loss of community. So if you look at uh, any study of happiness, and I got very interested in happiness at a certain point. I read 25 or 30 books on the subject. And being a member of a community yeah. is, is absolutely tied to happiness. So there are certain things you can do, like you know, therapy, selective serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like Prozac, those things will make you happy at a certain level. But what really makes people happy is relationships. And so I got interested because of that uh, in things like um, cooperative game theory and this idea of, of trying to understand why our brain is wired for cooperation and collaboration. And it really is. It's also wired for aggression and you know, territoriality. But I think it, that you know it's extremely upsetting to me to see people leaving cities in favor of this, uh, you know, comfort. And I, you know, I just, I have no interest in that, uh, in being comfortable was never a goal. What was, what was interested to me is like to be with people and to be stimulated. <clears throat> yeah, I, agreed. I think it's also, that is a really interesting sort of unique perspective um, of New York City. But I think in general, there's this move towards, um, you know, the, can, I've been really interested in my own work, I'll put it this way, in trying to figure out how to bring art to rural and suburban communities in a sort of a more active way, because we know that so much of our like really robust artistic experience, particularly the, the ones that are in the public, are not in all the publics, right? We, you know, it's really sort of easy to say like, oh, we should have more public art. Public art is great. Look at all the public art that's happening. But if you look at where it's happening, so, so many people are left out. And I know that this, I know that this has been really important to you in your work for a really long time, which is like making art more accessible and inclusive in a, in a like a true and real way, um, making, you know, helping more people to, um, have access to the art. In New York City, of course, Manhattan is very much sort of a, stands apart in many ways from many other sort of neighborhoods and the other boroughs. And so to like provide, you know, get art out of just those main, you know, those big corridors in Manhattan, I, I think is, is, you know, very similar to considering how to get art to the places that you know, dare I say, quote, need it most, which is sort of an odd thing to say, right? But maybe who lack it the most. And you mentioned that the key to happiness. Well, let me stop you there for a second. Yeah, please. And then you can continue. So the so as you said, I was a director of the Queens Museum for 12 years. Yeah. One of the things that we were, so Queens is the most diverse place in America by certain measures. You know, the majority of people there are um, immigrants. And if you take immigrants and children of immigrants, it's, it's yeah, two thirds of the people. So one of the things that's quite interesting, especially in, so in the Queens Museum, we're in between two, it's Flushing Meadows Corona Park. So Corona is over here and Flushing is over here and there's a park in the middle. And uh, when I was there, especially, it's changing a little bit now, Corona was very uh, Latinx, um, very diverse within that. And then um, uh, Flushing was very Chinese. But what you had was very different sort of habits of sociability compared to native born Americans. So there was a plaza called Corona Plaza um in the middle of corona and it was we saw this incredible potential there we started doing art programming there and over the period of many years it went from doing art programming to closing down the plaza from uh, the department of transportation closing down the plaza for traffic to redesigning it in a very collaborative community way and what we realized was that the habits of sociability of 
the folks coming from Latin America was just so different. And they really, plazas were such a part of the life of the cities that they were coming from, if they were coming from cities. The other thing that you mentioned, which is that a lot of immigrants in New York City are not people from cities also. So even though um, we're in the biggest city in America, we're also dealing with a lot of folks who would consider themselves like country people. Like the Mexicans in Queens aren't coming from Mexico City. I mean, some are, but the vast majority are coming from Puebla, which is countryside. So these are farmers and et cetera. So I, I found it fascinating. And I think that, you know, a lot of us, even in New York City, I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts, which was mostly apple orchards at the time I was growing up there. Um, I've, I've just been spending a bunch of time there with my mom recently. So I think that there's a lot sort of mixed experience for a lot of people in New York City. A lot of people are coming from elsewhere, mm-hmm. either coming from elsewhere in America or coming from elsewhere uh, as immigrants. So um, I, you know, when you talk about public art, one of the questions is how do people see themselves as the member of a public and what kind of uh, sensibility do they have around public things? And I just feel like, you know, in Corona, there was no problem with people sitting at home watching TV by themselves. People wanted to be in public. It was, you know, anytime we had like an outdoor festival, which we did all the time, um, it was just packed with people and they would dance, there are dance groups there, which is a great way to get people, you know, work collectively. And we did then a very long-term project, a social art project with Tanya Bergera called Immigrant Movement that lasted seven years. So I could talk about it further, but I'm just saying, when you talk about the country versus the city, it's kind of more complicated because, you know, there could be right now city people living in the country. Right. A lot of people that I know, like, I, which I very much regret, these people moving out to the comfortable place in the country. They're not country people. They don't know anything about the land. They never farmed. You know, as opposed to there's a lot of people with, with the opposite experience in New York City. Right. Yeah, no, that's that's really really interesting. And you know, you mentioned like what is the what is the relationship of people to the public? And I feel like that's part of what public art does or should do is is sometimes literally create the public, right? I I feel like a successful work of public art. You mentioned that project that you were just talking about. I'm, I, I'd love to hear about your experience with that, but especially a project that's longer term and or can be, um, iter- you know, have sort of several iterations in different neighborhoods, be moved around over time and space, et cetera. I think, it, you know, often it's those projects that can best create the feeling that you are a member of a public um, and, a, and a new and a different public, right? Because we're not just a member of one public or one community, right? There's sort of all these overlapping um, experiences, I think for each of us, even in the daily. And so like when we participate and interact in these artistic experiences, I think we can like become part of that public. Um, and, and I think that's, a, I would argue it's a really good thing. So you mentioned happiness and relationships, right? I very much agree. I think it's not just, and I mean, we have all the scientific studies that tell us it also creates health, right? It makes us live longer and all these things, right? The people that have the closer, you know, a sense of community and more, you know, good friends and valuable relationships live longer, are healthier people, et cetera. Um, we know this to be true, but what are those things that can develop them? Well, in part, also, I would argue all sorts of, um, you know, th- all sorts of elements of public space that we can sort of should be and could be working on to make more accessible and more inclusive and more um, more full of life and more inspiring, right? Um, more encouraging of communication, right? To sort of help people communicate, which which art obviously plays a great role in. But in general, I feel like if if relationships are a key to happiness, I'm taking your your line here as the beginning. If the, if that is, if we take that to be a truth, then. I, I would argue there's a there's a really really vital role for cooperative works in the public that people can participate in because if they can participate and in, in that moment have both sort of those everyday daily relationships like oh hey we're doing this together to the more um, you know sort of philosophical emotional experiences where you take part in something and recognize that, you know, the sort of universal humanity, which I think is is very real and very powerful. And so like, I think in both ways, it can help you to just say hi to the person next to you and have a reason to do so. It can also help you to cooperate and work with the person next to you, which I would argue is another level. And that can also sort of make you sort of reflect whether consciously or not so consciously on how, you know, we're all more 
similar, then we are different and all that, right? So- yeah, I mean, so I, I think it, what you're saying is very relevant to this project called the Immigrant Movement. Uh, right. So, so Tanya Bergera is Cuban, uh, but she came to New York actually to do a project, originally it was going to be, she had this idea, working with Creative Time and the Queen's Museum to start a political party for immigrants. And it's like, you can't do that if you're a nonprofit. You cannot be involved in starting a political party. You will lose your nonprofit status. So she was a little bit uh, taken aback because she thought she could do this. So then she decided what you can do is create a movement. So she found through uh, one of our community organizers, a space in Corona, Queens. And it, it became, it just had a science and immigrant movement. She never told anybody, by the way, for the first two years she was there, kind of who she was. She wasn't like, I'm a famous artist and nobody knew who she was. They just thought, here's an immigrant who wants to do a project around immigrant issues. So, so they started to do projects and she had finished her school in Havana, which is a school of art and behavior. It's a whole other story, but also lasted seven years. Uh, and so this almost became another school. It was all workshop after workshop after workshop. And some of the workshops were things like uh, <laughs> feminist art history in Spanish. Everything was in Spanish. Um, some of it was as nuts and bolts as safety, OSHA safety regulation training for construction workers. You have to have OSHA certification to work on a construction site, even if you're undocumented and the crew is uh, without papers. OSHA is very tough and they will close down the site. So yeah. I thought it was amazing. And I love that. Actually, I think it's a good story about America. Worker safety is important even if you're undocumented. So we did, there was OSHA safety um, protocols. And then two groups were born through this. One group was a group called um, Mujeres en Movimiento. It means women in movement or, and it, it really said women in the movement like immigrant movement. There was a group of, uh, of mostly Mexican, Ecuadorian women who started to think about their own health, psychological and physical health through wow. movement. And they started to do this thing like self-invented art therapy through dance. So they were studying and they started learning how to dance and doing all these different kinds of dance. They started doing it in public also in Corona Plaza down the street. Oh, cool. That's a group that's still quite active. And I'll get back to them in a moment. The other was um, there is the Venezuelan classical uh, music it's, it's called uh, El Sistema, and it's, it's, been, it's produced in Venezuela with some great uh, conductors. Like Duda Mel, who's now the conductor of the New York City Philharmonic, New York Philharmonic, came through El Sistema. So El Sistema is a way of learning classical music. You start by loving your instrument. You actually make a violin out of paper yourself. And you're, these are kids, like six or seven-year-old kids, they make it. And then they learn the very basics. Anyway, so it was uh, a group that was not founded by Tanya Bergera, but was born through the use of the space uh, in immigrant movement. I will say, you know, this is not a good way to judge, but I will say it anyway, because it's uh, that some of the students who came through that, and these are students mostly of uh, undocumented parents. Two of them are at Juilliard. And, and two of the kids that came through there are also at Cornell together. Uh, but what happened with uh, the Mujeres en Movimiento was that there was a certain point at when, when coronavirus hit New York City, COVID. That community became the actual hot spot center of the virus in the world. People were dying like crazy. I mean, I, I remember hearing a statistic that um, 215 grade school students in that district had lost one or both of their parents to COVID. I mean, it was, people were dying in large numbers. So what happened uh, then with the Mujeres is that they had this social network that was so strong and they had mutual trust and mutual collaboration that they were able to take care of each other in a way that never would have been possible if their, their group hadn't been formed. And so they feel like that it saved lives, but it also saved psychologically, people weren't alone. And it was this building of social networks that creates happiness, but also creates health. You're talking about health. So they were physically healthier because they were dancing and they're doing all this, you know, exercise, dancer size kind of exercise. And you see them all over the place in Corona. 
you'll be in the park, you'll see them, you'll see them in Corona Plaza, indoors, outdoors. They've just become, you know, fitness buffs through dance therapy. But that group was essential to mutual aid during the early days of the pandemic. And yeah. it all grew out of a socially collaborative project. Yeah, that's really interesting. I feel like that, I mean, that's a, obviously a very unique story with the, um, you know, in light of the pandemic, but um, I think there's a lot of similar stories where public art projects, socially cooperative, social practice, socially engaged art projects, however we shall refer to them, um, you know, really walk a fine line between sort of what are they doing? Or is this art? I mean, I can't tell you how many projects I've sort of spoke about, taught about, and people are like, oh, but is that really art? That sounds sort of like a political initiative or like a social program, or like you said, a building of a social network, right? A community project. Let's keep naming things that are not art, but I know it doesn't sound like art, right? Um, and what makes it art? And, you know, I've, it, it, this is something that I think that everyone that is sort of interested in this field has sort of thought about and struggled with. Like, is it even is it even worth it to try to sort of draw that line? Is that even an important sort of um, you know definition to try to sort of come up with as to where the art begins and the politics or the social cooperation ends, or the other way around? Um, and I think it's really interesting because a lot of these projects, it's like they are they are doing work that ostensibly could be done in some more governmental capacity, right? They are doing actual political and or social work. Sometimes yes, for health and happiness, but sometimes literally to feed communities, right? Sometimes yeah. it's a community garden. Sometimes it's a distribution of food. They are providing um, transportation communities, right? Various sort of biking projects. They're providing, right? All sorts of like actual tangible goods that are in need, particularly for groups that are lacking those, those assets and are lacking the privilege to, to gain easy access to them. And they're providing providing them, right? And so there is, I think there's this really sort of interesting mixing of socially cooperative art projects, um, design, so, and meaning what is usually, what usually distinguishes them where you know for sure that there are, is that they're in some way authored and or orchestrated, uh, you know, created a, a foundation is created for it by an artist, right? By someone who considers themselves to be an artist and they have sort of conceived of this project um, from this sort of aesthetic perspective. But the but the project is is helping people is ostensibly and you know manifestly helping people and i wonder what you think if if you think that that's um yeah i mean i i think it's a very first of all i'm very sympathetic with that argument i think that uh, i find it infuriating depending on who says it or i'm sympathetic with it but i want to say that you know i've been studying i'm writing a book about the history of museums so one of the things i looked at was the creation of the nonprofit sector in america why do we have it and so uh, around the time of World War I, and there was a lawsuit that, because they were trying to, they said, we need to fund World War I. So we're gonna impose an income tax like we have done in the Civil War. And there was a case that went up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, yes, you're correct. It's unconstitutional to have an income tax. And, and there's arguments to say it is. And there, there's certain kind of taxes that are allowed in the constitution. So then the, a group of people got together, very progressive, and they, they um, passed the 16th Amendment which allows the federal government to impose an income tax. So the 16th Amendment was a big success for progressives. So, you know, we're gonna tax the rich. And by the way, the highest income tax, which is really just for like the proto billionaires at that time, which is I think income over $2 million, which you're talking about in 1917, that's a lot yeah, of money. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the highest income tax was 67%. Wow. So this would be like if we imposed a, a billionaire's tax today, the, the general tax would be much, much lower. Anyway, but then they said, Oh my God, what are, what's, who's going to fund orphanages and hospitals and schools and museums? We have to give people a tax deduction for charitable contributions to these tax exempt organizations. So you could then pay less income tax, right? So, in a way, the whole idea of the nonprofit sector is for the government to avoid what it should be doing in the first place, as you're saying, Diana, that you know, the government should be feeding people and should be creating social connectivity or, you know, decent communities. And the fact that they're not doing it, that artists have to step in there. It's almost like the American tradition of nonprofit action is based on, on inadequate government. So you mentioned that I'm teaching, I've been teaching at CUNY. Yeah. And that is a school where one out of three students, comes from a family 
where the family income is $20,000 or less. However, these students are not going into debt because it's a public university, they're all working, so there's no student debt, and there are lots of students who are not middle class or lower middle class who are actually poor people, right? So poor people not going into debt is the basis of this, you know, very few, only 16% of, of Queens College students where I was teaching take out any student loans at all. And the ones who take out student loans generally take out like $10,000, which is a manageable debt limit. So that's the kind of institution that only government can create. The public school system, the public library system, the public hospital system, the public university system. So who are we kidding when we talk about, you know, the social practice artists? And by the way, I love them and I'm, I'm, I want to come at the end of this uh, saying I support it, which I do. But the big problems cannot be solved by social practice artists. The big problems are set, are caused, are the big problems are caused by capitalism and solved by government. I believe that to be true. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we have this system in which is plenty of money in New York City to go around to for everybody to be happy and well fed and everything, well educated, and it's it's stuck in these little areas, which are these the ultra rich who are figure out ways not to pay taxes. Anyway, but I do think what social practice art can do is create these models of cooperation and collaboration, which actually do do good things for individual people, but also create models that can be duplicated in other places and that it can, can show that cooperation and collaboration is an effective tool. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, please. <laughs> no, I, I, you, 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 you bring up so many good points because one, yes, I really, I strongly agree with that, th that what you said at the very end, that I think that social practice art is actually a really, really effective and interesting model for how to be collaborative, to how to be cooperative, to how to cooperate. Um, and I think it could be used in sort of all discipline fields, arenas, like this is knowledge that is really important and we're gaining it from art when in general, I think we can all agree that art has is often relegated to a secondary, if not, you know, further down the chain, um, sort of in the realm of importance of sort of, you know, social and intellectual assets in the world, right? Like no one's going to throw art away, but everyone is going to say, well, we other things are better, right? E economic efficiency, anything that's efficient and things that are profitable and and the STEM fields, which I have no problem with the STEM fields, right? But they always come before, before art, right? We have determined that generally they're, they are those which... and you bring up capitalism, I, I mean, I think it can be no debate, right? All the jokes about the starving artist and you don't make money in art, you don't make money in philosophy, ha, ha, ha. We have to think about where the money comes from, right? How we're going to do things efficiently. And that's what ends up being valued in society, right? I think this is fairly non-controversial um, in all different ways, meaning from in funding ways, but also in, in the sort of cultural, you know, the cultural uh, feel, the cultural moment, um, generally speaking. And so, you know, I think that, Yes, I think you're right. I think that if you if you went and spoke as you have um, so many times to the to the artists that are making these projects, I think they would say, well, something was not there. Something was not happening. People were in need. The community was in need. This was dead space or empty space or, or right or available space. And I filled it. Right. I made something happen there and it did help people. And sometimes it helps a lot of people. And you're right. And of course, it's going to help more people if you can move it around, if you can bring it to more places, if you can create a model that others can duplicate um, that aren't you. Right. And you could really make it even an international um, model. And that's a great thing. But, you know, when you I think that when you hear from these artists, a lot of times they say, you know, I felt compelled to do something because someone else wasn't doing anything about it. And that someone else, of course, is in some sense, some, you know, some facet of the government that was not serving the people. Right, but then the thing is that then, is it the most effective way to, so let's say you're correct. I think you are correct. In some cases, uh, somebody feels compelled to do something because let's say the government isn't doing it. So there are two things you could do that might be more effective than, be, than doing a social practice art project. One is to try to understand why people don't trust government in the first place and why government is underfunded. Why is it that we allow in the United States, a, whatever, a quarter of our population to have no health insurance, where in Europe that's considered inconceivable? Yeah. Why is it that we don't trust government to provide free public education straight through university like they do in Europe? Why is it that medicine is privatized as a for-profit business here? So what is it that an artist could do to express 
this question of, you know, why don't we trust government to do this stuff? Because in Europe, they do trust government to do that stuff. And they do it very well in general. I mean, it's very bureaucratic, I understand. And there's a lot of people who say, well, why is it that, you know, rich Europeans come to America for healthcare? It's like, I understand, but on the other hand, it's a healthier, and they live longer than us as a country. So why, okay, so that's number one. And then the other thing is, what about if artists spent their time rather than trying to solve the problem themselves, attacking government for not doing it? Like, what if they created a campaign to uh, make government do their job better? So one is, which I prefer, uh, a campaign to get people to trust government. And the other is to say to government, you need to do this. Why is it a better strategy to go out there and try to solve a problem? Okay, so I will say that I don't, I think a lot of artists don't necessarily think in completely in goal-oriented terms like teleological, like I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna solve this problem of homelessness or that, this or that. And what they often do, like what Tanya, I feel, did in Corona was she was very process oriented. She's like, I'm gonna open a space to kind of see what happens. And all this stuff kind of coalesced around it because it was so open-ended and creative. And that's something government could never do, especially not for that amount of money. I mean, we spent money on that, but you know, government opened, tried to open a community center in Corona that did all the things that they did. Forget it, it couldn't be done. Um, and the same thing with Project Row Houses in Houston, which I think is another exemplary project. And he didn't, that, that group of artists didn't set out to build a mega organization. They just said, these are cool houses. Let's see, let's pick them up, see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, though, I'm so you know grateful that Rick Lowe and others like made that decision, right? I, I love that artists see those opportunities and think, let me do something. Let me create this moment. And I think those moments matter. And I think we agree here. I mean, I think we want those moments to happen and we and we and they're they we want them to matter. But I see what you mean. It's like absolutely it's like pushing off work that should be done by a government to artists who do not, no matter what, have the sort of the capacity to then, you know, do that work that needs to be done in the way, it, you know, to the extent in which it needs to be done. It reminds me of, I remember reading Nickel and Dimed. Are you familiar with that book? Um, Nickel and Dimed. It's, it's, it's fascinating. It's an older book now. It's probably like 20, 30 years old now, but it's, um, she tells the story of sort of minimum wage life in the United States. And she takes on, she does this sort of anthropological experiment where she goes and works in three different states, three different minimum wage jobs, and sort of talks about the experience. She is, of course, sort of a privileged, educated uh, person. She's a journalist. She has a PhD. And she's like, let me go sort of live this experience. And she talks about um, going to work, at, uh, showing up at Walmart. And at the orientation, Walmart says to her, you know, whoever the manager at Walmart says, they show a video and then they basically say, uh, we don't provide you healthcare benefits, but here you go. Here's some information on Medicaid. Go check it out. Take care. And, you know, it reminds me of the same thing where it's Walmart not taking on responsibility to provide the benefits that, of course, they should be providing. But they're like, hey, check out the government's program. You should look them up. And it's almost similar to me, right, where like, artists are sort of put in this position, they're seeing a need, right? Because I do think there's something to the artistic, like the perspective of the artist that is going to see need in a particular way. I mean, I have more thoughts on it. I can explain that more, but I think that there's, that's an interesting sort of moment where an artist can see that and say, okay, how can I fill this space? But it's like too much pressure, right? I mean, last time we were talking, you brought up Rick Lowe, last time you we were talking, you were, you were mentioning sort of the, the feeling of like, is this enough? Am I doing enough? Is it doing, is it making the change that I want it to make? And that also puts an enormous amount of pressure on the artist, on art in general and social practice art to do that. I mean, I remember speaking with a group of students last sort of connecting story to this um, about public space uh, last semester. And when they were talking about how in their communities, there was no public space. They, there was a suburban community and they were describing how there was just really nowhere to gather, right? There was no sort of public forum at all. And they were like, but the neighbors had taken it upon themselves to have these sort of parties in their driveways. And they were great, you know, they were of means. So they bought a bunch of food and they set up a grill and they were hosting people and it was beautiful. And I, I feel like this is exactly what you're saying because my response was, that's beautiful. That's great. Have tons of driveway parties. Don't ever stop. But you're making up for the fact that there's no public space and someone should be giving you real public space. You shouldn't have yeah, to have a driveway hand, party. You know, the, the, you you know what I mean? People who live in those suburbs made the choice to live in a place that doesn't have public space. 
And then, but then also that what that neighbor is doing is sort of like a social practice project, whether it's social practice art right. or not. Totally. It's a social practice project. Then maybe driveways are a cool public space. Yeah. You could just go down the street driveway to driveway. Yeah. The other thing about that I was, I've just been, again, because I'm thinking about writing this book about museums, you know that the um, Crystal Bridges is fully funded by Walmart. Okay. No. Walmart built the building and then gave them $800 million. So what do you say Walmart is a tradition of fighting unions tooth and nail? And as bad as things are here, uh, you know, it's much worse. You know, that the, a lot of the stuff that, that is made, that the clothes that you buy at Walmart, a lot of them are made in Bangladesh. And the minimum wage in Bangladesh is $75 a month. Month. That's not enough to live a decent wage. Whenever there, when there was a fire, I mean, not a fire, the building collapsed and killed more than a thousand people in Bangladesh, making stuff for places like Walmart and The Gap and Target. A group of uh, progressive, um, uh, you know, uh, garment makers signed a petition about, or signed on to certain um, health and safety regulations for the factories they work with. Walmart did not sign that. So there's this idea um, in, there's a book called uh, the revolution will not be funded. And the woman who wrote that, name is Gilmore, says, when you think about the money that's funding, uh, <clears throat> you know, nonprofits or, or something like a museum, the money has been stolen twice. It's stolen from the workers who created the wealth. And then it's stolen from the, from the tax base. So when I'm teaching at Queens College and they make cuts, it's a public entity that doesn't have enough money to run because people aren't paying enough taxes. In the case of Walmart, or in the case of the Crystal Bridges Museum, the money, I think, has been stolen three times. It's first and foremost stolen from the people in Bangladesh. It's second stolen from the people who are working at Walmart, and it's third stolen from the tax base. So one of the questions I have is, that's pretty obvious once you think about it. You just have like, so in this book, I may have a picture of, you know, people, workers in Bangladesh, and then Crystal Bridges. Forget about Walmart, just like, this is funding this. This is where the money's come from. So those kind of juxtapositions are the kinds of things also that artists are quite good at. And there's a, there's a show um, at the Whitney right now, <clears throat> that, you know, artist in Klein, and he has these Walmart workers, uh, sculptures of Walmart workers in trash bags and stuff. It's very labor oriented. Um, and I think that sometimes that there's a, this is political art as opposed to kind of social art or public art. But the message there, I think, is quite strong. And then you think back and say, all right, where's the Whitney's money from? You know, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Robert Barron. And how much does it cost to get into the Whitney? $25. So then you circle back to this idea that the kind of art we're talking about, generally speaking, is free and open to the public and really to the public, meaning not elites. Right. So the people working in uh, with Sonia Bergera in the immigrant movement were you know, delivery people and they clean people's houses and they care for people's kids and they're undocumented. And to say then, you know, you create this model of cooperative action and collaboration and the, and the way that the people in the community took it on as a place so they could create their own power. I think there's a lot of moving and um, complex social artistry involved in creating that opportunity. You know, one of the things that Tanya said was, one of the first things they did was try to say, okay, I understand you're cleaning houses in the United States. What did you do back in the old country? Where are you coming from? What was it, you know, to respect that idea that, that a lot of people made huge sacrifices to come here in, uh, in these immigrant communities and give up everything and then their kids are gonna prosper, right? So we learned that this one woman who's the head of Mujeres and Movimiento is from Mexico and she came from a indigenous, um, community that didn't speak Spanish. So she's from the countryside, she's native, and she spoke Mexteca, which is a native language. And sort of, and then, but what she was good at also was this certain kind of embroidery. And that she started with her friends doing this incredible embroidery. And this is aside from exercising. And they would be like, they're constantly making dresses and stuff, which were based on the traditions. And these are artistic traditions from their home country. So anyway, all that stuff that was sort of bubbled to the surface, which is never anticipated by Tanya, I think is incredibly 
uh, moving as art. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I wonder what you think. So we're talking a lot about um, a directly political art or an sort of indirectly political art, socially cooperative, socially engaged art that is serving a directly political purpose, right? Actually sort of aid, aiding people in some, in some way. Um, but then I think, and we talked a little bit about this last time, and I'm curious what you think. I really do believe and part of it, yes, it's optimistic and part of it is hopeful and romantic, but part of it, I think, is also is very, very true and real. And I believe it with every fiber of my being that that art can also create going back to relationships, those feelings. I mean, I really believe that it has the capacity to help people to feel to feel more connected to each other and just in simple terms. Um, and there's many different ways and manifestations of that. But just in simple terms, it can aid connection. I feel like, you know, yes, we know it can aid sort of therapy and healing and communication, but I mean, connection, the kind of connection that, you know, so many thinkers and artists have talked about throughout the centuries that, that people are lacking, whether it's speaking of workers, whether it's Marx talking about the worker feeling alienated and estranged, right, from other workers and from themselves. And, you know, one thing that often people don't talk about is Marx also talked about how that worker would feel estranged from for essentially from human connection, from like feeling like a human, feeling like other humans. It's a really sort of interesting argument. And so I feel like art does this. I really do. And then I wonder if what you think about, um, uh, I think we agree that when art serves a directly political purpose, that's important and interesting, right? It's, I mean, some projects are deeply compelling and also make a big difference. I mean, some of them make a big difference over time. You mentioned seven years and the projects go on for 10, 20 years sometimes. And uh, you know, make a very real difference that people can quantify and sort of write about. Um, but even when that isn't the case, right? Maybe when a project is just beautiful, emotional, creates a moment, creates a a, a, a a happening, right? An experience. I like to think that all those sort of little changes, right? And obviously when you or I show up and experience the project, yeah, maybe that's preaching to the choir. Maybe we were going to show up anyway and feel that way anyway, right? But if you can get the project, truly out to the people, right? Like to all the people, right? And to all the sort of little nooks and crannies of, of the world and of communities and of neighborhoods. And more and more people have those experiences. I think, I really think this, I wonder if you're gonna be like, well, that's very optimistic, that that is the beginning of how we, we create the type of, dare I say, revolution in sort of spirit and in culture, because you brought up a little while back, well, why don't people trust the government? And why are we sort of like this in America, right? Why do we tend towards the libertarian, even when we're not libertarians, right? Like, why do why is it so distinct from the social democracies of Europe? And I think part of the reason is, is something that's been there since the very beginning of the American experiment, right? There's this, there's this individualism, this privacy, this this sort of, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps um, type of sort of culture that's just like born into America, not to mention that American democracy just sort of shook hands with capitalism right from the start. And they are just, you know, like peanut butter and jelly. They've been they've been going on right as you know, throughout the American experience. And so I feel like culturally, I feel like the answer to that is is um, both a simple and a complex one. Right. That culturally in America, there is this general move away from commune from communal mindedness in fact i think sometimes i really would go so far as to say that sometimes i think acceptance of dependency on others is seen as a weakness like it is literally seen yeah, as sure. culturally as a weakness which i think is is deeply mistaken and problematic and even like dangerous and unhealthy going back to your point earlier um because de that dependency right is part of those connections those relationships that i totally agree with you bring us happiness right um and so say that's right and that there is this strong tenet in american culture of pushing away from the communal towards the individual i feel like art can aid that little by little not not the kind where we're like yeah. the work the government should be doing but from a like a different perspective of political change you know so i think by the way that the the i'll try to be helpful also i know we're coming to the end so i'll try to be helpful at the end um so if you read a book like bowling alone or these books about uh, increasing individualism that the you know in um you know alexis de tocqueville brought the word individualism into the english language he was trying to figure out what is so what is this characteristic and so it was it never it wasn't an english word 
the French word, individualism or something, you know, like the same word. Um, but at the same time, he said America is a country of joiners and mm -hmm. civic associations are everywhere. And so, and they're, you know, like the Chamber of Commerce and the, these, you know, business associations are, and then in, um, you know, in the 50s, there began to be this like big nosedive of those kinds of associations. But I, th I see hope. So my son's 30 years old and he, you know, he works in a job that he likes, but he's also very active in his union. And there's a lot of union um, uh, organizing happening at museums that's led by young people. And that even just the word union, it's about being together uh, around a cause, but it's also, there's a lot of being at the union hall or being with other union people or going to union meetings that is, uh, I think, very much in the spirit of what's happening in the arts right now. It's one museum after the next. I don't think there has been a vote yet at a museum that turned down a union try, right? So I think, you know, it's a reaction against a kind of, I'm in it by myself. There's nothing about a union that says I'm in it by myself. It's like, we are going to collectively bargain. It's like the word collective is in there and, and the word union. <laughs> yeah. So I do think that there is that possibility. And I think that the, you know, a lot of social practice artists are, are you know, they're all about a different kind of union and collectivity. And I think it's a, you know, it's a counter reaction against like the severe individualism that America was suffering from. Yeah, I think that, um... I always think that there is that the role of artists, not to say that they have one singular role, but a really important role for artists has always been, and I think always will be, to serve it, to provide sort of critical commentary on the status quo, right? I think that that always to sort of have that looking out, looking in, sort of you bring up Tocqueville, right? That sort of outsider perspective almost to always sort of look and observe and sort of note where there there it could be another way to provide alternatives, right? Because art can literally create different realities. Right. Think, I mean, think about like really sort of profound works that you've experienced. It's like you go somewhere, you know, you, you think about it a different way. Like, oh, it could be like this. You know, I could feel like this. Everyday life could be like this. And I and so that capacity to almost like create like fantasize about the way it could be, should be even right. Um, is really is a really sort of special role that that artists, I think, will always, always have and always take on. And then socially pra social practice artists can say can actually like do that. Right. So they can create the different reality, but not just by making a beautiful you know work of dance or music or a painting that you just can't take your eyes off of, which is which is a really you know special moment when viewing art. But they can do something else where they can think, no, you're there is no viewer you are part of the art, right? You're an active participant, you're gonna do it. So you're gonna like feel that alternative reality. So even if we think of say a social practice project, that's whatever, a community garden, then maybe there's something aesthetically sort of beautiful to it in a variety of different ways. But like, if you're gonna be a part of that, then you're, you're, you're experiencing actually eating food from a garden that you grew with other people. Talk about yeah. union, collective, collaborative, right? Like actually living that way. Um, and I And I think that maybe that's a, Maybe it's maybe that moment lasts longer. I don't know. Than what you know, than experiencing an artwork in which you're the spectator, even if you're really moved by it. If you actually sort of experience the different reality that the artist is either creating or just setting the foundation for, and then you create it, right? Um, so you know, I, again, in this museum book, that I'm yeah, working on, I think it, that there's really two major paradigms for museums that have been warring against each other. But then there's kind of a third which is the, the sort of the aesthetic museum where you have this sort of almost spiritual relationship with the individual work of art and you're sort of understanding and communing with the artist, whatever, in the very individual by yourself way. And then that's one side and, that, and then there's the educational museum, which was meant to, you know, to teach people something very specific. And then there's this idea of the museum as forum, right? And I think that, the, the, that that's what I think is needed in museums, and that's what is needed in our country. And something gets a little bit away from the horrors of social media, which is not really social, it's antisocial, because it's a for-profit um, enterprise that's drawing upon your social instincts uh, to make profit. And, and it's, you know, it is uh, promoting outrage, et cetera. But if a museum could become a forum, and if we, if arts could embrace the idea that artists are very good at this, at creating moments of connectivity and debate and you know and it's it's a room within institutions for 
And who are you going to call on to, to make the forum work? Of course, socially engaged artists. You know, the social practice. That's what they've been practicing is the social. Um, so that's, in a way, that's one of the things we're, we're talking about in this book is this idea of sort of moving, not, not even, even disregarding the profound experience you can have one-on-one -on -one with a great work of art and not disregarding the value of educational opportunities, but to, to have the forum be a major part of of the cultural life. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think that's a, sort of a nice way to start drawing this conversation to a close because um, I think that if, and you, again, you've spoken to a lot of these artists, but when you speak to those that are making this work, I think a lot of them will say, well, my intention, what, like the intentions are different, right? My intention was to create, to spark a conversation. My content, my intention was to draw attention to an issue, or my intention was to create a moment or, was, or to create a community where I didn't see one or to create space for someone. So it could be, a, it, there's many different sort of reasons, I think. Um, and I guess I just bring that up because, you know, we have these terms, public art, social practice art, and I think they're just really, really, really complex. There's a vast and deep diversity within them and people are making art for different reasons and to a different end. Um, but I love that idea um, of sort of bringing museums back into this conversation. And it's really interesting to me that you're writing this book and I look forward to reading it because you have spent a lifetime working, yes, in museums, but also in, in bring, you know, muse art outside the walls of a museum. And so it's interesting to me now that after these other two books that you've written, so you're now sort of exploring how museums can sort of do that work, that opening of dialogue and debate and connection and relationship and um, ultimately happiness, maybe, maybe that's <laughs> where it's going, right? Back to happiness, back to all yeah. those books and happiness. Um, it's really interesting. Thank you. This has been really, uh, really wonderful. Um, yeah, I have you. questions, but you know, we're going to have to stop. So, um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, in, maybe a part two sometime. I would love that, Tom. Um, okay. thank you so much. Really, really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. And good luck with the book. And, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Mm -hmm.